is here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Guess what? There's a vote around 8 p.m. tonight, I'm told, on this, uh, on this deal. It's likely to pass the House, and then it goes to the Senate. Now, there are conservatives in the Senate, are there not? Our buddy Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, there's Rand Paul, who's a libertarian, there's some others. Uh, J.D. Vance, you know the list. What will they do? Now, they're going to be in the minority. But they can slow it down. They can slow the vote down. They can offer amendments. There's other things they can do in the Senate that you can't do in the House. What will they do? So we'll watch that. See what they do or do not do. And to reiterate, not that I really need to, but to underscore, to make it abundantly clear, I would not vote for this. Why? Because I think they should have fought another month or two. They had that much time. There was not going to be a default. And probably get even a better deal. But here's where I differ from some. These attacks on Kevin McCarthy are actually bizarre. I started to think about this this morning. In four months' time, this guy has had numerous bills passed through a very, very tight house on parental rights, on the wall and securing the border, one after another. And they go to the Senate and they die in the Senate. For the Republicans really are do-nothings. Do-nothings, especially under McConnell. He mustered a, a majority to put an initial proposal, debt increase. Passed it, sent it to the Senate. And the White House had it. The Senate has done absolutely nothing. They could have voted on it. Why didn't they? They did nothing. And I know we had 43 Republican senators sign a letter. But there was no jumping up and down demanding a vote on the Republican proposal. And Biden sat on his hands hoping that the Republicans would fray and they didn't. And that's how the negotiations such as they were began. In truncated form. So the only one carrying any water are the Republicans in the House and McCarthy. And so his his negotiators negotiate this deal that comes back. 
Some people are happy, some people are unhappy, some people aren't sure what they are, and so forth and so on. So in this process, what the House passed was never going to become law. Because the Senate wouldn't take it up, and Biden wouldn't agree to it. And the House Republicans can't enforce this on their own. So the argument then is, could they've gotten a better deal? And I believe if they'd been more patient, they likely could have. Now we have these committees in Congress, one headed by Jordan, one headed by Comer, who are really working very, very hard. We're going to have Julie Kelly on it in hour three. To try and peel the onion on some of these terrible scandals. And they're not giving up. Now, they don't have the power to prosecute anybody. Not in ways that they would use. And they've uncovered a lot so far. Whether the American people are interested or not is a whole other issue. And so when you consider there's a very small majority of Republicans in the House, for the responsibilities that the House has under Article 1, it's been pretty active. And it's been pretty conservative. But in the case of this, it's just not good enough. Now I see our friends including one who I will debate tomorrow night. They're so thrilled in a way. This proves how terrible Mark, uh, Kevin McCarthy is. And you hear this from some pseudo-conservatives, an actual conservative. I think to myself, well, who else was going to do anything? It's perplexing. Nobody else could be speaker on the Republican side. Those are the facts. You can ignore the facts. Those are the facts. Nobody. You can go over there and negotiate with Biden and get the best deal in the world. You're not going to get enough people in the House of Representatives to vote for. This is the system today. It's broken. This is the system today. It doesn't work. So they can trash McCarthy all they want. Why? It's a freebie. It's a freebie. I already said I would not vote for this. And I also said during January that if McCarthy does something that I disagree with, I'll say so. And I said so. But McCarthy's not the devil here. This system has been going on for a decade. Well, finally, we're going to draw a line. How? The system cannot be fixed inside Washington. And anybody who says it can is a liar. There are ways to try and deal with it. Ways and try to box it in a bit. Ways to try and limit it. But the Democrats will win the House again. With the Senate and the presidency. And there'll be few ways to stop them. There will be few ways to stop them. Which is why I'm having Mark Meckler on this program in about an hour. Head of Convention of States. To explain that what's required here, at least on the political and constitutional side, is something much more fundamental. And that rather than beating our chest endlessly about this, and we can beat it somewhat, I got it. Would it be great if the debate were over convention of states day in and day out? So why don't conservatives raise it? You know, if you crack open... 
Liberty and Tyranny. From many, many, many years ago. Here's what I say here. What can be done? What can be done? I don't pretend to have all the answers. Moreover, the act of writing a book places practical limits on what can be said in any given time, but I do have some thoughts. The conservative must become more engaged in public matters. It is in his nature to live and let live, to attend to his family, to volunteer time with his church and synagogue, and to quietly assist a friend, a neighbor, or even a stranger. These are certainly admirable qualities that contribute to the overall health of the community. But it's no longer enough. The statists, counter-revolution, now I would say the Marxists, that's where we've come to, has turned the instrumentalities of public affairs and public governance against the civil society. They can no longer be left to the devices of the statists, which is largely the case today. This will require a new generation of conservative activists, larger in number, shrewder, and more articulate than before, who seek to blunt the statist counter-revolution, not, intimidate, not, not imitate it, and gradually and steadily reverse course. More conservatives than before will need to seek elective and appointed office, fill the ranks of the administrative state, hold teaching positions in public schools and universities, and find positions in Hollywood and the media where they can make a difference in infinite ways. The status doesn't have a birthright ownership to these institutions. And the conservative must fight for them, mold them, and where appropriate, eliminate them, where they are destructive to the preservation and improvement of the civil society. In other words, don't surrender the bureaucracy, the different agencies and divisions and departments. Don't surrender the culture to these people infiltrate them participate in them take them over I think this is very very important and I point out here the administrative state of course I write in more detail in the book but these are the proposals Sunset all independent federal agencies every year, subject to Congress affirmatively reestablishing them. Require federal departments and agencies to reimburse individuals and enterprises for the costs associated with the devaluation of their personal private. From the issuance of regulations that compromise the use of their property, eliminate unions for federal government employment, and so forth and so on. There is a whole laundry list of things. Unfortunately, in the system today, most of them cannot be adopted. Because Alexis de Tocqueville warned about this. Basically, the endless complexities. You have court challenges, you have activist courts, you have bureaucracies making law, you have Congress that is either unattentive or attentive in a way that is contrary to constitutional limitations. You have a media that basically is a mouthpiece for the state when the Democrats control it, and the Democrats, even when they're out of office. That's why I was thinking, there's got to be something bigger that we can do. There has to be something else. There has to be another way. And there is. See, ladies and gentlemen, we have some people out there who, who believe they can invent new ideas, invent new principles that over the last thousands of years that the great thinkers hadn't thought of. And most of these people are in their late 20s, early 30s, mid 30s, and many of them haven't done a damn thing except write about their ideas. We here behind this microphone, we've been involved in grassroots movements, whether it's the Tea Party, the Parents Movement, Convention of States, 
We've looked for real and concrete ways to confront the foundational problems in our politics and our culture. We don't just write columns and issue white papers. We don't just participate in debates till we're blue in the face. We try to do something about this. Even if they had the best deal you can imagine, even if we had the deal that they voted on originally adopted by a Democrat president, a Democrat Senate, and a tiny majority in the House, even if all their wet dreams came true, and I wish they did, because we have to fight at every level and in every way, the trajectory of the republic is very dire. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. What else do we do? Liberty and tyranny, faith. Pose all efforts to denude the nation of its founding justification. That is, God-given unalienable natural rights. The government can neither confer on the individual nor deny to him. And yet the Marxist seeks the authority to do both, which explains his contempt for or misuse of faith. Moreover, faith provides the moral order that ties one generation to the next, without which the civil society cannot survive. That's number nine in the conservative manifesto. And of course, somewhere in the Communist Manifesto, it is Marx who despises faith and despises family. And you can see how this poison is spreading throughout society. This debate on Capitol Hill tonight, it's important, but it has nothing to do with that too. There's a lot of things we need to be, <coughs> excuse me, be doing and pushing. I'll be right back. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. Can't got your tongue? Cough up a fur ball and call 877-381-3811 right now from Mike Levin. You know, there's another issue here, folks. 
And that's the public. The people, many of whom I disagree with, say populism. We need more populism. I'm not into mobocracy, and I'm not into centralized ruling class authoritarianism. I'm into constitutionalism. The framers are geniuses. And here's why. Just 17%, this is from um, hmm, Yahoo News, just 17% of Americans agree with, and this is their language, not mine, right-wing Republicans who insist Congress should let the U.S. default on its loans rather than raise the debt ceiling without deep spending cuts, according to a new Yahoo News YouGov poll. Instead, the public favors by a two-to-one margin the sort of bipartisan deal struck over the weekend by President Biden and GOP House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. That deal, which includes smaller spending freezes and reductions in exchange for a two-year debt ceiling hike, is now moving through Congress despite objections from the far-right House Freedom Caucus. Far-right? They're not far-right, they're conservatives. Do they ever use the phrase far-left? It's always progressives. The Yahoo News YouGov survey of 1,520 adults was conducted from May 25 to May 30, both before and after Biden and McCarthy announced their agreement. As such, it inquired about Republicans' initial demands for deep cuts and subsequent negotiations over smaller cuts rather than the specifics of the plan. When asked how they would feel about, quote, President Biden and GOP House Speaker Kevin McCarthy agreeing to smaller spending cuts in order to raise the debt limit, which could be approved with a combination of Democratic and Republican votes at voters at 8 p.m. tonight. A clear consensus emerges across party lines, they write. Overall, twice as many Americans say they would favor such a compromise, 43%, as say they would oppose, 21%. And while Democrats were the most positive group by 54 to 17%, both independents, 41 to 20%, and Republicans, 43 to 28 percent, also expressed more support than opposition. And the survey shows similar results to follow-up questions about how House Republicans should react if Biden refuses to accept deeper Republican spending cuts. Uh, let's see, in response, a full 56 percent of Americans say Republicans should either agree to smaller cuts that can pass with Democratic and Republican votes, 36 percent or agree to raise the debt limit without any spending cuts at all, 20%. Only a minority of 17% say the GOP should let the U.S. default on its loans. Even among Republicans, just 27% would support a default in this scenario. At least twice as many would favor smaller cuts, 41%, or a clean debt limit hike without belt tightening, 9%. So the, that's where the public is. So this is why I'm not a so-called populist. Nor do I believe in the iron fist of Washington and the ruling class. What does the Constitution tell us? Why don't we embrace it? And so as long as the public is in this sort of a mindset, that creates a problem too for really the rubber hitting the road. Even though I continue to believe a few months longer would have resulted in a better deal. But it's also why I don't trash Kevin McCarthy. I think it's a cheap thing. Cheap. He's done a hell of a lot of good. He's done, I would say he's the most conservative speaker of the House, and it's a close race with Newt Gingrich. Maybe in modern times. Who's better? Who else was there? And they talk about this as a first step, there'll be other steps. So when we're trying to save this country, 
There's a number of battlefields that we have to fight on. This is one of them. No question. This is one of them. But the Constitution has been significantly destroyed. And if we can get our Constitution back, even most of it back, things like this are less likely to happen. Which is why I wrote the Liberty Amendments. Which is why we spent a year discussing the Liberty Amendments. Which is why Mark Meckler and Convention of States and their millions of members, many of whom are active, do what they do. This is why former Senator Rick Santorum reversed course as an opponent and now a supporter. This is why former Senator DeMint, first an opponent, now a supporter. This is why Tom Coburn retired from the United States Senate probably the most fiscally conservative senator in modern times, bar none, and immediately joined Convention of States. And we miss him very much. Great hero passed away from cancer. I remember when Mike Farris, Mark Meckler, Tom Coburn and I had a meeting at the Heritage Foundation. And we tried to convince them at the time to support the Convention of the States. We were unsuccessful. I don't know what the position of the Heritage Foundation is today. I haven't looked, quite frankly, but I just don't know. Uh, I shouldn't have to look if they support it. They should be out there pounding away right now. Brother DeMint, he should be pounding away right now. All the conservative institutions should be pounding away right now, but they're not. It's very troubling to me. Here's Representative Andy Biggs, who was the Senate president in Arizona prior to joining the House, being questioned by Steve Ducey. Cut one, go. Uh, we heard some people yesterday, at least one person said, uh, this guy's got to go. What, what do you think is going to happen with Kevin McCarthy, the speaker? Well, you know, I, uh, Steve, I can't project what will happen with Kevin. I know there's a lot of dissatisfaction. I've been focusing on the bill and trying to get the word out on what I think are the, the problems with the bill. Uh, it's hard to say uh, what will happen with Kevin. Uh, I'm more concerned what's going to go on with the trajectory of the term because does this represent a new coalition and a new trajectory where uh, the speaker is going to go to uh, uh, the Democrats more and more to try to uh, put forward whatever he thinks his agenda ought to be. And that's that's really concerning with uh, to me and I think it should be concerning to members of our conference. Well, ultimately, you would agree that the Republicans got more out of the deal than the Democrats. No, I don't think I would agree with that at all. So if you're Andy Biggs, what do you do about this? You're not going to be able to remove Kevin McCarthy because you're in a very distinct minority. What are you going to do about it? And I'm somebody who worked with Mark Meadows. If Mark Meadows is around these days going public, he'll tell you. That he called me one day when I was defending him. He was under attack by Boehner. We talked about how to do it. And I was even involved in telling him how to write it up. Because he asked me. That's not this situation. McCarthy has brought conservatives into these different committees. They're on the rules committee. They're on all these other committees. Everybody wants to say it's a dead letter. It doesn't matter. Of course it matters. Boehner trashed conservatives left and right. He trashed the Tea Party that gave him, and he had this massive majority, massive, in 2010. We won, what was it, 66, 68, 62 seats. 
It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. He had a significant majority. McCarthy has a tiny majority. And I blame that on, among others, Mitch McConnell. And he's still sitting out there waiting around for everybody else to act, and then he'll be Mr. Critic no matter what happens. But I'm saying this not as a critic, but I'm asking you folks. So you're, you're Andy Biggs, what do you do about this? What do you do? You see he's reluctant to remove McCarthy because it's not going to work. Well, what will work? Well, one of the things that we need to keep fighting for, among many on different fronts, he wrote a book against. Convention of States. Now, people are out there with all kinds of... I, I feel like conservatives, in some cases, are becoming like Marxists. No, 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 no. Forget about Reagan... Forget about the principles of old. I think this is this NatCon crowd. Forget about all that. Although, so much of what they support is right here in liberty and tyranny. I have to admit that. As I study this more, I really wasn't all that familiar. I'm familiar now. And some incongruities, too. Which we'll discuss as time goes on. But that aside... When the framers of the Constitution give you a mechanism, difficult, difficult as it is, shouldn't we be promoting it as a way to help us? Especially if everything else you've tried fails from your perspective? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And this isn't just directed at a group of people. It's directed at all of us. It's directed at all the Republicans. One of my best friends on Capitol Hill is Chip Roy. He supports Convention of States, by the way. He was an early supporter. Another one of my best friends on Capitol Hill is Mike Lee. Nobody's smarter than Mike. I haven't checked in the last year or so, but Mike opposed the Convention of States. Why? It's black and white text in the Constitution. It's impossible to have a constitutional convention, is what they say. It's a convention of the states. You know, before we had a Constitution, there was... There were conventions, which were basically meetings. That's all they were, meetings of various representatives from various states to try and figure out what to do. There wasn't this all-powerful central government that they had. They were responsible, sovereign states, and they said, how do we figure this out? That's exactly what Convention of States is. A state legislature, not the governor, not the lieutenant governor, not the courts, signs off in a formal way to have a meeting, in essence, to discuss possible ways to fix what's taking place in the country. And one of the big problems is, ladies and gentlemen, is various aspects of our Constitution have been altered without amendments. And so there's some great ideas out there. I have some of my own. What do we do about this? And we'll discuss this with Meckler in the next hour. This needs to be discussed more by concern. I don't care if you call yourself a NatCon, a NeoCon, a ConCon, a uh, PrisonCon. I don't care what kind of con you call yourself or self-identify as. This should be a rallying point. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, I know you guys are worried. Federal Reserve staff said banking crises fallout could push the economy into recession this year. But you can do something about that. Learn how to protect the retirement you worked really hard for. 
I think a great way is to diversify with gold and specifically a gold IRA. That's right, physical gold in your IRA. My favorite gold IRA company is Augusta Precious Metals. You got to call these guys and learn how a gold IRA can help you. So if you've saved 100000 or more in a 401k or an IRA, call Augusta Precious Metals and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Tell them Mark sent you, and they'll give you a free gold coin when you open a gold IRA. Call Augusta Precious Metals today, 877-4-GOLD-IRA. That's 877-4-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions. Get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. What a great company. This is, this is chess. This is not checkers. It's not tic-tac-toe. And you've got to think through not just one step, but five, six, or eight, or ten steps. And in that consequence, I think that Kevin McCarthy got a pretty good deal. And most importantly... He shifted the balance of power and the balance of leadership away from both the Senate and the White House. And that is, frankly, a historic experience comparable to what we did in 1995. Another, another prominent voice, former speaker, in fact, Newt Gingrich. I want to make a suggestion. Those Senate Republicans who are not happy with what was negotiated, and I know there are several, and those who believe that we could have gotten a better deal, use your position in the United States Senate. Use the rules of the United States Senate to slow this down. It's not just on McCarthy. We've got conservatives in the Senate, too. And I want to encourage the conservative groups out there. CPI, Freedom Works, Heritage Foundation, Club for Growth. I have friends at all of them. All of them. Let's go. What are you waiting for? We have conservatives in the Senate, who can issue amendment after amendment after amendment and try and slow this thing down. Are they going to do it or not? Don't keep pointing at the House. The Senate hasn't done a damn thing. The Senate hasn't done a damn thing. I don't care about a letter with 43 signatories. Let's see what they do. Let's see what they do. Oh, man, we've got great, great programming ahead. Mark Meckler coming up next hour, very, very crucial. Julie Kelly, Hour 3, some really breaking stuff. January 6th and beyond. Stick with us. I'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, everybody. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811. 877-381-3811. Important reminder. If you want to hear this program via podcast, which means anytime you choose to listen to it, once I do it, say you have other things you're doing at the time, or a preempted, or anything of that sort. You can do this. You go to marklevinshow.com, M-A-R-K-L-E-V-I-N show.com, click on Audio Rewind, and select your favorite platform. It's that simple. Or search Mark Levin Show on your favorite 
podcast platform already. So it's very simple to get to us. It's all 100% free. We also have our own YouTube channel. You now can find all my full podcasts, interviews, specials on YouTube. All of them. You go to YouTube.com at Mark Levin Show. YouTube.com at Mark Levin Show or search Mark Levin Show in YouTube. We're having tremendous success on both these platforms. Somebody said to me, you know, Mark, if you just did podcasts, you could be right up there and challenge Joe Rogan. I don't think so. I don't think so. But let me ask you a question apart from all that nonsense. If you could only hear me on a podcast in a big city, I bet you would listen to it, wouldn't you? I bet you would download it. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Let us continue here, Mr. Producer. We've got a lot more to say. We have uh, some very important news. <clears throat> New Biden's offered safe harbor to Hunter Biden. Messages appear to confirm influence peddling scheme. Again, I don't know what the hell it's going to take. Nothing, really, for the Department of Injustice to appoint a special counsel here. It's shocking. A new report from Jonathan Turley, good man, is raising eyebrows about new messages that were uncovered that appear to confirm the Biden family's alleged influence peddling scheme over their red state, they write. According to the write-up in the New York Post, text messages show Joe Biden appearing to know about his embattled son's business dealings. The current president's brother, Jim Biden, also comforted Hunter Biden in another message while indicating that Joe Biden was directly involved in what they were doing. Got that? The background of the text messages, as explained by Turley, is a 2018 piece published by the New York Times. It represented one of the first admissions by the mainstream media that Hunter Biden's business dealings and personal life were problematic. In response to that article in 2018, Biden's team worked frantically to try to get it altered. How much was changed, we don't know. What we do know is that Joe Biden then told his son that, quote, I think you're in the clear. Now, you've heard that phrase before, but now we have more context. He said, as Biden associates pushed the Times to change aspects of the story, Joe Biden called to report on the results. In his message, Biden ends his call to Hunter with the statement, I think you are clear. And anyway, if you get a chance, give me a call. I love you. How would Joe Biden know his son is in the clear if he knew nothing of his son's business dealings? The answer is that he wouldn't. That's long been a serious contradiction because the current president is clearly lying. Clearly lying, as much evidence shows, when he says he was oblivious. With that said, I I don't doubt that Joe Biden's affection for his son was real, yet that doesn't excuse what appears to be a corrupt arrangement. It ended up with millions of dollars of foreign money suspiciously making its way into these shell corporations, almost 20 of them, where the money was distributed among nine family members. Money coming from communist China and Romania and other places. Enter Jim Biden, the president's troubled brother, who also has a long checkered history of trading on Joe Biden's name. In another message following the Times report, Jim Biden offered Hunter Biden, quote, a safe harbor, unquote. It's what he said. It's really eye-opening. Here's the quote right out of the emails. The new messages indicate, Turley writes, that the Bidens were worried that Hunter was in a free fall as these dealings were becoming known and revenue was declining. Jim Biden appears to be rushing to get Hunter to work on the problem with the family. He assures him that they can find him, quote, a safe harbor, unquote. And that, quote, I can work with your father alone, unquote. I can work with your father alone, unquote. 
Hello, Merrick Garland. Hello. Hello. Nah, he's asleep. The messages may refer to the fact that Hunter's past complaint, complaint was that he was giving as much as half his proceeds to his father. He's now facing towering financial demands. The offer for Safe Harbor appears to be related to a drug binge that Hunter Harbor, that Hunter Biden was on at the time. Not fear of criminal prosecution. Jim Biden was asking his nephew to come back, but the reason doesn't appear to be related to well-being. When you read the next line, I suspect that, quote, can was actually meant to be can't in the message, as that would make far more sense. Regardless, no matter which word was meant, the point of the message is the same. Jim and Hunter Biden were working directly with Joe Biden during a period of corrupt farm business dealings. That we have emails proving that Hunter Biden was upset for having to give so much of his money to his father only underscores the message. Joe Biden can no longer lie his way out of this. There's too much evidence that he knew what his son was doing. Now, over at Media, I, Mediocreite, this front group set up by Dan Abrams, who's sort of the Jerry Springer of the, uh, of the legal field, although that would demean Jerry Springer, and I don't mean to do that. He's the guy with the squirrel glued to his head. Over at Mediocreite, they're not covering this. Why? Over at MSNBC, they're not covering this. Why? Over at CNN, they're not covering this. Why? Why? Because it's a cover-up. That's why. No, no. Everybody's sitting around waiting for Donald Trump to get indicted. We don't even have special counsel investigating Joe Biden. Nothing. We've got emails up the wazoo. We have text messages up the wazoo. There is more than enough. There's not one predicate. There's multiple predicates. To open a special counsel investigation, I think that's what Turley's point is. And that ought to be the point of all legal analysts. It's shocking how mobbed up, if you will, the Bidens are. And that includes the head mobster, Joe Biden. It's incredible. And what's sad is he gets away with this stuff, at least for now. But we have a couple of committees that are digging and digging hard under, uh, under the current speaker, McCarthy. But I look at this young lady, Tara Reid, was raped by Joe Biden when she was a staffer. Almost nobody would listen to her. And now there's this sad story in the Daily Wire. She never felt safe in America. She didn't feel protected. She was being bullied by the Biden mobs, mobsters. Biden rape accuser Tara Reid defects to Russia for protection and safety. You know what, folks? That broke my heart when I thought about that, and when I'd see this young woman. She said, it's remarkable that Joe Biden raped me when I worked for him at Congress, and I'm supposed to be the fugitive. That is ridiculous, and it's unacceptable. So she goes to Russia for protection from the Biden crime family. I wonder what Maggie Haberman thinks. No problem, right? With this disgusting Joy Reid with the disgusting view clowns. Nothing. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan 
With Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast to start saving today. Mark Meckler, Convention of States. How are you, brother? I'm good. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Isn't... Let me ask you a question. This, this fight over the death ceiling. Even if we got everything that was in that initial bill that was passed, the trajectory is not fixed, is it, Mark Meckler? No, absolutely not. I mean, I, I looked at the original deal... And, you know, as my dad used to say, it's better than the sharp stick in the eye, but not a lot. And there's really the expectation that some people have or create that Washington is going to fix itself is simply not accurate, is it? Well, it's certainly never been accurate in my lifetime, Mark, and I would argue that it's not been accurate in the entire history of the country. If you go all the way back to the Washington administration, the very first administration, every administration since then, with the exception of Coolidge, has grown the size and scope of the federal government. So those of us who love liberty, believe we need a smaller and less intrusive federal government, we should know by history Washington, D.C. is never going to do that. Do you think the problem is that we have the wrong principles, largely free market, uh, largely... um, sort of constitutional conservatism and so forth? Or do you think that these these elements within our society for so long have been eating away at the foundations that we need to get back and fix the foundations? Yeah, I think, Mark, the way I would describe it, it's a structural problem. In other words, what we've done is we actually have broken the structure of our mm-hmm. system of governance in Washington, D.C. Congress has done it. Presidents have contributed to it. Largely, the responsibility falls on the federal courts who have exponentially expanded the authority of the federal government. That's why we have this big, bloated, overreaching federal behemoth. It's going to take structural reform to bring it back down to size. And how do we get structural reform to bring it back down to size? Well, there are two options. Uh, Option number one is we go to Washington, D.C., and we beg them to do it for us. And I laugh. I can't say that with a straight face because, look, they're human beings. They don't have the incentive to make government smaller. That's a painful and difficult thing to do, and it doesn't line their pockets, and it doesn't give them more power. The second way is we use the second clause of Article 5. We call a convention of states, and we propose amendments that will effectively impose those restrictions on the federal government. Members of Congress, Republicans in particular, do you get many of them out there on the campaign trail when they're running for office or at all? At press conferences and so forth and say, look, I want to get spending under control. I want to get the government out of control. I want to shrink the government. And so I support Convention of States. I don't hear a lot of that, do you? No, very little of it, Mark. In fact, very few of them will weigh in, I think. Uh, You know, they lack the the courage to do it. And the reason they lack the courage, and it actually really drives me crazy, is because there is a fringe on the right that's against the idea of calling a convention of states. And when I say a fringe, I want to be really blatant and direct about what I mean. Maybe, maybe it's 5% of the Republican Party that doesn't want to do this. They're they're frankly now... What kind of groups? ...saying this. Oh, groups like Eagle Forum, groups like Concerned Women for America, groups like the Birch Society, and they parrot the talking points of the radical left on this. And so I think with the politicians, it's not that they believe those folks. Mostly it's like, well, we just don't want to have the fight with them. We're not willing to stand on principle for this. Here's so, I mean, I've asked a number of conservatives who contact me on this budget stuff and so forth. And they're off the record, of course. And I say, well, why aren't you getting behind convention? Well, I support it. I said, well, that's not what I asked you. Why aren't you getting behind it? Why aren't you pushing it? Why, 
we don't need to change our principles. We need to change the way we go about doing things. Yes? Yeah, I agree with you. Look, so this is my point is a lot of folks are just simply afraid to engage in the fight. Or they'll say, Mark, well, I'm in Congress. That's not really my fight because it's not up to Congress to call the convention. It's up to the states to call the convention. And while that's technically true, the fight belongs to all of us because if what we believe in are the principles that we say we believe in, a smaller government, a limited government, a government where the citizen is bigger and the federal government is smaller, well, then we have to fight on principle. And this is the most principled stand for federalism that anybody in our system of government could take. And so they need to stand on principle. Plus, aren't they citizens of the United States? (laughs) Yeah, you know, this is what I don't understand, Mark, is this is the fight of our lives. We are watching the republic collapse all around us. We are proposing solutions in Washington, D.C. right now that won't fix the problems that ail us. And and I'm going to be a little bit even maybe more doomsday. If we were to elect uh, a Republican House majority in the coming election, and and so now you have the House and the Senate, if we were to defeat President Biden with a conservative president, I am not hopeful that that president and that Congress would shrink our government because history tells me otherwise. And you would have judicial challenges, you would have sabotage by the bureaucracy, you would have all these things that take place because, in my view, the Marxist left now, they know what they're doing. They know what they've conquered. They know what they devoured. And so the only way to, or the only one of the only significant ways, let me put it that way, to actually effectively push back is a tough process, but it's a process we need to get behind, and that is to put back in the Constitution what the courts took out. Now, people say to me, Mark Meckler, but if they don't adhere to that, well, if they don't adhere to that, it's over. It's over. Yeah, There's look, nothing we can do beyond that. You know, people who say that, Mark, we have a new term for them. I call them bunker Republicans, bunker conservatives. In other words, all they want to do is go to their bunker and hide out. And they're not willing to engage in the process, and they're not willing to fight for the country, and they've essentially given up. And if they've already given up, then they should, in my opinion, to be blunt, they should shut up and go home and hide and let the rest of us save the country for everybody. Do you find even many columnists writing about convention estates? I looked. I don't see a lot. No, there's not a lot, Mark. And, you know, back in the old days when when you wrote Liberty Amendments and Mike Ferris and I started this project, I made some assumptions which have turned out to be wrong. I thought, man, if we get 10 states, people are going to pay attention. When we get 20 states, people are going to freak out, and you're going to see it all over the media. This is going to be the cause celeb for every conservative in the country. I thought everybody would get on board. I actually thought at, by the time we got to this point, it would be pretty easy to get everybody on board. Everybody would be writing about it. But you're right, except for the left, i got to say, because we get regular attacks from the radical left in the media. Don't hang up, Mark Meckler. I've got several more questions for you, my friend. Convention of States, you have millions of members. Is that not correct? Over 5.3 million supporters. Well, you would think that would drive somebody's attention or draw it. We'll be right back. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and, of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. Mark Levin, the research arm of conservative media. Call in now, 877-381-3811. Now, Mark Meckler, I received a uh, a text 
from my stepson David earlier today telling us that at a press conference, Ron DeSantis endorsed Article 5 Convention of States to deal with, in particular, term limits in the budget. Now, that's pretty good. Yeah, I think that's great. And uh, DeSantis has long been endorser of the Convention of States project, so he's out there talking about it. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy has openly come out and talked about it. Beautiful. Uh, Nikki Haley has sort of gently talked about it, kind of she's sort of milk toast on everything from my perspective, but she's talked about it more in the background. I think we're going to see this become an issue in this presidential campaign, and I think that's good, and I think it's important enough that it should be an issue. Do you get invited on many podcast shows to discuss this, any significant podcast shows? You know, Mark, certainly nothing at the level of, of you. Of course, you're at the very pinnacle of conservative media. I do a lot of media, but I would describe it mostly as, you know, and I don't mean this with any negative connotation. Local or regional, sort of right? Second, yeah, yeah, second or third tier media. And I love those guys, really appreciate the fact they're out I there do doing too. it. I do too. They're the best. But, Yep, but very few what you would call national names uh, have me on. It's just not something that they see as either important or on their radar. They're, I don't get any opposition from those guys. It's just they tend to be focused on whatever the hot item is in the news is today exactly. nationally. They sort of mimic the national media. So yep. you know, everybody right now, all they're going to talk about is the debt ceiling fight. And also, Mark, I think you and I are having a discussion here that's super unusual in the media, which is what's the solution? We all know the problems, and so we can lament the problems, we can point out the problems, but what you're bringing up is a solution, and you don't hear much of that in the media. Imagine if we were united behind this effort. I mean, some of us are. Tell the story of Tom Coburn, senator from Oklahoma who passed away, a real tremendous hero. You know, Tom Coburn was somebody that I had met when he was in the Senate. We had a couple conversations in his office. Uh, he's just a, he was one of the most impressive people I ever met. He's a guy that was a supporter of the Tea Party movement, but never talked about it out loud because he didn't want anybody to think he was co-opting it like so many did. A real humble public servant. And towards the end of his career in the Senate, uh, one night my wife Patty was watching television. She was watching Fox News, and she started shouting that, Senator Coburn had said he was going to work for a convention of states. Now, I didn't know him that well, and we had certainly never talked about that. I called his communications director, uh, and his, John Hart was his communications director. And John, I said to John, you know, I, I just heard on TV that Senator Coburn is going to work for a convention of states. And John said, yeah, we did too. And we both mm -hmm. laughed about it because Coburn was just a free spirit. He did what he wanted. And when I eventually talked to him about it, he said, look, you know, I'm leaving the United States Senate two years early. He knew that he had cancer that was likely terminal, and he said, I just don't want to spend the rest of my life doing nothing. I want to fight for the one thing that I believe can save the country. And so he literally left the United States Senate to come to work for Convention of States. He spent the last five years of his life traveling around the country, working for Convention of States. I was privileged to travel with him and learn from him. Towards the end of his life, I remember you know, my wife, Patty, works for the organization Shelves Raise the Money. And she tried to take him off the road. I remember her saying, you know, Tom, you need to rest. You need to relax. And he said, I intend to die with my boots on. I don't want to hear you talk about that ever again. And, and he worked until the very last, Mark, because this was the only thing he believed would save the country. And I remember the last time I met him at your event in Virginia. And I gave him a big hug. You sent me a photo, which I have right here. This guy put everything on the line when he was in Congress, the House, the Senate. He fought like hell, like some of these other guys. And then he realized the system is too broken. That's why I don't attack Kevin McCarthy right now, to be honest with you, Mark. I think he's done pretty well with what he has. I would have waited this out a little longer. I wouldn't have voted for this. But they're, they're all kind of stuck in this system, and they need to wake up to this fact particularly those who keep saying, you know, we can do better, we can do better. Well, help us do better. Help us do better. Help us help you. That's the message I'm trying to get across, no? Yeah, I completely agree with you. And and I feel, by the way, the same way about McCarthy. I'm originally from California, now I'm a Texan. But like I've known McCarthy for a long time. I wasn't thrilled that he was becoming speaker. He's done way better than I thought he would do. 
Uh, and I think, well, I wouldn't vote for this deal. I don't know how much better they can do. I admire the guys that are saying we should still fight also. I, look, I get that, and I'm glad there are folks that are stiff of spine in Congress. But every single one of them ought to look at themselves, ought to look at the state of Congress, and ought to say, that's not the fix. We can be in here fighting. We should fight as hard as we can. But we should fight for the outside solution that's driven by the people. Every one of these people we're talking about, Mark, says they believe in federalism. But Article 5 is the ultimate act of federalism, calling a convention. And they all need to get behind it. One of the things I love you talked about last night is about, like, keeping a list. Who in Congress, which of our quote-unquote allies in Congress, are publicly in support of convention of states? They need to speak out, and they need to speak out now. And not that I want to get into it. Some of them are not. Not most of them. Some of them. Which, to me, is a headbanger. I don't even get it. <clears throat> I don't yeah, get, and they, complain, and only... they complain to me about, oh, we can't get... So well, what are you going to do about it? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, and to me, Mark, that's one of the most amazing things is those who say they're against it. There are only a few that I'm aware of in Congress, literally, I think, three of them. And when you ask them what their solution is, when you say what you just said, well, what are you going to do about it? They don't have a solution. Or they say, oh, we need to elect a Republican House of Representatives or a Republican president. And I just look at them dumbfounded and say, really, so how's that worked out for you in the past? And if they're honest, the answer is it hasn't. And, and that's not to say I don't want to see Republicans elected. I want to see a Republican majority. I want to see a Republican president. It's just we have to have reasonable expectations about what they can do and what they will do. Exactly. And what they can't do and what they won't do is restore federalism to the United that's States correct. of America. It's 100 percent right. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think we should abandon our principles and find new principles? Is that the answer? Now, look, the principles on which the United States are based are actually eternal principles. And they're eternal. That means they never change and they never go away. And we actually know from our history that they work. This is the longest lived constitution in the history of the world. The average constitution lasts 17 years. We're pushing on 250 years. That's an extraordinary feat. And it is because it is a principles based constitution. So what we need to do is not abandon them. We need to actually return to them. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important. And that's why when you look at the Constitution, Mark Meckler is also a lawyer, they don't support mobocracy and they don't support autocracy. They support a representative, limited government with the different branches have different functions. The different branches have individuals who are appointed differently. And so... Uh, They knew that they weren't creating the perfect document. They created these methods for amending, but they didn't want the Constitution amended easily. But they they gave it to us because they didn't want uh, violent revolutions. George Mason told us that, correct? Yeah, look, Mason inserted this second clause of Article 5 or suggested it on September 15, 1787, He addresses everybody assembled. It's two days before the end of convention. It's basically over at this point. And he says, we have a terrible problem with this document. We gave the power to Congress to propose amendments, but we didn't give that same power to the people acting through the states. I'm paraphrasing here. And he asked the question, are we so naive that we believe that a government that becomes a tyranny would ever propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? Now, they all understood human nature. They were great students of human nature. We have no examples in history of tyrants deciding to return power to the people that they're tyrannizing. And so he suggests this, and Eldridge Gary proposes the language for the second clause of Article 5, giving the states this power. This is incredible because Mason's notes reflect at this point that there was actually no debate. It says NINCOM, Latin abbreviations for no comment. No debate, no comment, and it was unanimous to insert this power in the Constitution. They all understood, Mark, that we would absolutely undeniably come to this moment and the states and the people would have to stand to save the republic. Mm-hmm. So, so important to understand our history. And you're exactly right. We've lasted a long time as a prosperous and free people, but now we're up against it. I'd say in the last several decades. Actually, I'd say since Franklin Roosevelt and before, actually. But we're definitely up against it now. There's no question about it. So, Mark Meckler, if people want to find out how to join or how to help Convention of States, where do they go? 
they go to conventionofstates.com. They can click on to the sign the petition button. That'll allow them to let their state legislators know that they're in favor. That's important in states that have already passed as well. We had a rescission attempt in Alabama. We pushed back this year. So in every state, that's important. Then they should click on the Take Action tab. This is the most important thing, Mark. Look, you have been in this fight literally since you were a kid, and you've been taking action your whole life, not just talking, but taking action. Everybody out there needs to take action. They need to be involved in the fight. So if they click on the Take Action tab, they can get involved in a meaningful way. How many states do we have so far? Well, we have 19 that I would say are officially in the docket. Kansas makes number 20. They passed it, but they have something in their state constitution that says that they have to have a two-thirds vote instead of a majority. That's unconstitutional under the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution. So we're going to have to litigate that one. But I would say we're at 20 right now. North Carolina is pending. We've passed the House. We're hopefully about to pass the Senate. That'll make it number 21 and leave us with 13 states to go. It's amazing how little attention this gets, except you're right from the left that's scared to death of it. Well, now that you mention this, these things I've been doing and you've been doing, what do you make of sort of a new crop of some kind of conservatives who say, you know, you old time conservatives and your principles and your way of doing business, they haven't worked. So it's time for national populism and all the rest of this stuff. I, I just feel like I'm dealing yeah. with Mark. I feel like I'm dealing with Marxists. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, forget the history, forget the past, forget the guys that came before. And I'm not even talking about me. Forget all the great thinkers. Forget all them. Today is the day. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, look, those people are not conservatives, Mark, because conservatives stand for conserving that which is eternal, those principles upon which this country was built. It doesn't mean that you don't move forward. But it means you maintain the eternal principles, you conserve that which is good and great and beautiful in the country's history, and then you build on top of that. You know, Mark, when the Tea Party movement started, this goes back to 2009, I remember one of the things that really bothered me, so this has always been the same, is there were folks in the Tea Party movement that pretended like people like you and others who had come before us didn't exist. Like, we were the first conservatives ever in the United States of America. And one of the things that I understood is that conservatives always, if they understand what conservatism means, stand on the shoulders of those who came before them, philosophical giants, political giants, warriors that were willing to step into the arena. There, There is no ability to have this fight if those people didn't come before us. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge them, read their works, listen to their speeches, understand them, and, and then move forward on that foundation. When you and I, uh, I only have about a minute, when you and I started this, uh, looking at this Article 5 Convention of States, I strongly opposed it. Until I read about it and thought about it, you, we both did. And I said, wait a minute, what the hell am I doing? This is exactly right. Go ahead. Yeah, Mark, you know, I, I was on the record. I, I did a conference at Harvard Law, uh, not a bastion of conservatism. It was co-hosted by a liberal guy who's a professor there, and I was sort of neutral. I just thought, "Ah, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. I can't imagine you could actually do it. And then I did what you did. I spent the time. I got involved. I learned from people who understood more than me. And then people like you and me and Mike Ferris and Tom Coburn and Rick Santorum and so many others got on board. Now I am absolutely convinced that this is the primary way that we are going to save this republic. All right, my friend. Thanks for everything, and be well, and we want to have you back. So tell us what's going on out there when you need to. You got it. Thank you, Mark. God bless you, my friend. And God bless you, too. There's a great hero right there. He's not all talk. He's action. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan 
With Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. Now, what can you do about it? I recommend, particularly if your congressman's a Republican, call them and tell them to speak out and support Convention of States. They can bang their heads against the wall all they want. They can blame Kevin McCarthy all they want. They can talk about Nirvana all they want. We have a system, potentially, within the Constitution that can go a long way in helping us. That can go a long way in helping. Nothing's perfect. But it can go a long way in helping us. That's what they can do. And that's what you can do. Conventionofstates.com. Mr. Producer, put that link, if you would, on all of our social platforms. That's Please go to conventionofstates.com. I'm a big believer in this. And uh, there's 5.2 million members. Think about it. Jim DeMint, one of the greatest conservatives in the Senate, he got fed up and he left. Tom Coburn, one of the greatest conservatives in the Senate, he got fed up and he left. We've had other great conservatives in the Senate, other great conservatives in the House. But they've been unable to push the ball in any significant way. They've been unable to, in any significant way. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. This L.A. Dodgers thing is really unbelievable. I mean, there's this, this really fringe group. They're even fringe when it comes to drag queens. And there they are dragged or dressed up as drag queen nuns. Of course that offends Catholics and the Catholic Church. They don't come dressed as drag queens, as imams, do they, Mr. Producer? No. That might be problematic. No, they certainly don't do that. So in other words, they don't, they don't get dressed up as drag queens and offend the Muslim faith. Maybe they ought to give that a shot and see what happens with the L.A. Dodgers if they would embrace that. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, is that Christianity is under attack in this country, as is Judaism under attack. And you can see it in the culture, and you can see it with the likes of the Los Angeles Dodgers. A few years back, it was football, taking a knee, disrespecting our nation, the men and women who fought for our nation, going on and on about social justice. Because, you know, in America, you're not free to actually do anything. And now we have baseball. 
baseball that about five years ago, you know, people went to baseball because they didn't want to go to football. Now we have this. The Los Angeles Dodgers, the second biggest city in America, at least for now. Although people are trying to get the hell out of there as fast as they can, of course. The Los Angeles Dodgers, writes Fox, are not open to discussing the reinvitation of an anti-Catholic drag queen group. One religious advocacy group says, Catholic Vote, one of the largest lay Catholic advocacy organizations in the country, said they spoke to the Dodgers administration this week about the team's partnership with the Sister of Perpetual Indulgence Drag Queen Collection. We sent them a letter last week asking for a phone call or a meeting, in part because they'd announced that they were listening to all sides, said Catholic Vote President Brian Birch. To our knowledge, they'd not spoken with or reached out in any way to a Catholic leader, religious or lay, like ourselves. So we did receive an email in response to our letter, and that turned into a phone call that I had yesterday. The top-level Dodgers executive, Birch, continued. He said that's, that, uh, that it's uh, been very hectic there, and he's been very busy, and that he had little time to talk with me, but wanted to reach out in response to the letter. Birch told Fox News Digital he urged the executive to meet with Catholic groups and reconsider their partnership. The Sisters are Perpetual Indulgence. So keep in mind now, This is an attack on the Catholic Church. It's what it is. These weren't drag queens being drag queens. These were drag queens being nuns. As I said, if these were drag queens being imams, I don't think they'd get away with it. So I said, he writes, well, if there's still a chance that you might reconsider your decision, please let me know. We will withhold the ad campaign. That we're planning to launch this week, Birch said. The Dodgers executive said he cannot do that. So what they did is they originally, the Dodgers pulled back. Then they took heat from the radicals. Then they went back to it. And now they're blowing off, of course, the Catholic community. That's right. Discrimination. Bigotry. You won't hear about it on MSLSD. You won't hear about it from Joy Reid. You won't hear about it from the morning schmo and Mrs. Schmo. If you watch those networks, you have no idea what's going on in this country. And then, ever hear Belk, B-E-L-K, Mr. Producer? It's another department store chain. New York Post. Belk is targeting children as young as two with transgender pride merchandise. I mean, seriously? Till Tuesday, the department store chain's website was selling a boy's t-shirt that displayed the words, so happy to be me, and featured a blue, pink, and white happy face, the colors of the transgender pride flag. Shirt was removed from Belk's website just hours after Fox Business reached out asking if it was aware of the merchandise. The company did not provide a statement by press time. I'll tell you what I think's going on. They have marketing people, HR people, other types of executives are pushing this stuff. And I think the CEO or others, they're going, what the hell did we just do? Of course, some of the CEOs are in on it. Show support with the kids Pride Graphic T-shirt. Our toddler and you T-shirt is sort of adorable for everyday wear, Belk's description for the shirt stated. While the description of the shirt said it was meant for boys ages 4 to 7, it was available in sizes as small as 2T, toddler. Another pro-LGBTQ shirt. You realize how small this community is and how ubiquitous it is at the same time? Another pro-LGBTQ shirt for boys that are still currently on Belk's website doesn't have any words but features various ice cream confections bearing the colors of the lesbian flag, the transgender flag, the gay pride flag, the bisexual flag, and a milkshake with the letter Q for queer. 
Boy, I'm so out of it. I don't even know what flags we're talking about. Both shirts on Belk's website were sold via online retailer Instant Message. However, if a person clicks on several of the items, an error page will appear saying Belk no longer carries this item. Instant Message did not respond to Fox News Digital's request for comment. Belk boasts a pride section on its website that features an array of LGBTQ clothing and products, some geared toward children as young as four. But upon clicking many of the items, an error page appears saying Belk no longer carries this item. It's unfreaking believable. I'm not done. I just pulled some of these together today. This one will break your heart. Chick-fil-A sparks anti-woke outrage for VP of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion post. Chick-fil-A, which is closed on Sundays, as you know, for religious reasons. The chicken sandwich chain long beloved by conservatives for its long-standing opposition to same-sex marriage. Sparking boycott calls after announcing that it has hired an executive in charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's that whole Marxist thing. The Atlanta-based company named Eric McReynolds to the post of vice president of DEI two years ago, but social media users took note of it in recent days, igniting angry denunciations on Twitter from conservatives who allege that the firm has gone woke. McReynolds has been employed by Chick-fil-A since 2007, He's promoted the position of vice president of DEI in November 2021. But the recent LGBTQ controversies involving brands such as Bud Light, Target, and Kohl's. Did you hear about Kohl's? It's another one. Have triggered scrutiny of other corporate actors. Like my daughter says, Dad, I'm running out of places to shop. I'm running out of places to shop. She does not want to expose her kids to all this sexuality when they're going out looking for clothes. Corporate America embrace of DEI, which seeks to diversify workforce, has been criticized, and rightly so. Um, and so there you have it. So you have Belk, Coles, Target, the L.A. Dodgers, Chick-fil-A with the DEI, and I'm sure there's more to come. Be right back. Mark Lovin. We have our dear friend Julie Kelly with us. I've given her the Mark Levin Award rather than the Pulitzer Prize because, Julie, as you well know, the Pulitzer Prize isn't worth the paper it's written on, assuming it's written on something. And uh, it's there's not. some breaking it's news such that a I. Great honor. Well, thank you. And there's some breaking news that I wanted you to tell us about involving the tapes of January 6th and so forth. Go right ahead. So, Mark, thanks for having me on. As you know, there are thousands of hours of surveillance video captured by security cameras inside and outside the Capitol on January 5th and 6th that the government, particularly the Department of Justice, has kept under wraps from the American people and even January 6th defendants. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, working with Speaker McCarthy, promised to make those videos public. I believe that they will at some point. But in the meantime, um, I've been given access, along with two other reporters, to look, start looking, digging through that uh, huge trove of surveillance video. That announcement was made today by Marjorie Taylor Greene on Twitter. And I believe the first clip will, first set of clips will be uh, start airing tomorrow night uh, by John hmm. Solomon. So you, John Solomon, who's the third? Another reporter, um, he he hasn't really wanted his name out there yet, All but right, he is won't. a very, he, he's a solid investigative reporter. He's done a lot of good work on January 6th. This is a big deal, though, isn't it? You haven't had access to this before, have you? I have not, Mark. And, you know, my first article demanding the release of this footage was two years ago today, uh, Mar- May of 2021. When the government filed an affidavit 
telling the courts that they needed to keep even Mark's 30 and 45 second clips under protective orders. Defendants have to sign this crazy um, protective order to they they can't even see the evidence against them without a paralegal there or someone else. They can't copy it. They can't download it. They can't share it. That's how tightly controlled uh, this video has been since January of 2021. And Capitol Police also have tried to keep it under wraps. This has been a real battle in court. And now um, I really commend Speaker McCarthy and Marjorie Taylor Greene for at least for now, allowing us to access it and hopefully at some point making it all available to the public. You know, you're you're an incredibly intelligent person. You're a lawyer. Step back and look. It's almost like there's two disparate views of Kevin McCarthy, isn't it? Comes under brutal assault uh, when people don't agree with what he does. And then on the other hand, when I talk to people like you and Jim Jordan and Comer and others, it's like we've never had a guy like this before who's done these various things and so forth. So in your own instance... I guess it's refreshing, right? This has been. I do want to say I'm not a lawyer, though. Thankfully, I think it's helped well, me you in my be. reporting on January 6th. I say you should get an honorary law degree from Instruction yes. University after all this work. Um, but it is refreshing. And I'll tell you what, though, Mark, and you know this. January 6th is a huge issue for the base. They are appalled at how that event has been weaponized against uh, their countrymen, Trump, Donald Trump himself, and certainly his voters. We now have more than a thousand defendants who have been criminally charged. Matthew Graves, the D.C. U.S. attorney, threatening to double that caseload. They are arresting new people, Mark, every single week. Unbelievable. At the same time, Matthew Graves has totally memory hold the riots that started three years ago this week, far more destructive and dangerous and a bigger threat to the president and Republican lawmakers than anything that happened January 6th. Mm -hmm. I was told by a former U.S. attorney, Brent Tolman, who was the U.S. attorney for Utah, Mm -hmm. and I had him on my Sunday show week before this one, and he said something brand new that didn't get any attention whatsoever. He said he knows, as a matter of fact, that the former U.S. attorney before Graves, was not going to round up hundreds and then thousands of people to undertake this campaign by the Department of Justice. And he disagreed with Maine Justice. So they replaced him with Graves. Had you heard that before? I have not. Was he referring to Michael Sherwin, who's the acting D.C. U.S. attorney? It could be. At the time of January 6th, okay. Yeah, so he said... He wanted to focus in on, you know, maybe a score of people, two scores of people, whatever, the leaders of this and that. But they wanted him, according to Tolman, and Tolman is a good man. He was U.S. attorney, again, from Utah and everything. And he said, and he said, no, I, that's not what I'm doing. That's not how we do things here. And Graves said he'd do that. Makes a lot of sense to me. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Matthew Graves was a Biden campaign advisor and installed by Joe Biden to take out, to carry on his dirty work, rounding up Trump supporters and destroying their lives. All right. Hold on one little bit. I want to have you over the break. We'll be right back. Mark Levin, the thunder on the right. Call in now, 877-381-3811. Welcome back, America. We have our friend Julie Kelly, tremendous journalist. So you're going to have access to these tapes. And you're going to have a lot of tapes. Are you going to be able to handle all this? I'm sure you're going to be up morning, noon, and night going through them. Well, here's the thing. The access, I have to go to Washington, D.C. and access the footage. It's a very complicated system. Yeah. Um, so it's not anything for people. And, and I felt this way, too, Mark. Just upload the tapes. Let everyone see it. That's certainly not the case. You're talking about hundreds of cameras. And so when I went in, I had certain time frames and certain areas of the Capitol inside it out that I wanted to look at. 
And boy, it, it is overwhelming. You know, yeah. you could sit for an hour and look at a certain area for maybe two minutes. And it could be spellbounding, right? I mean, you're, you're looking at it and go, wait, let me see that again and have to play, re-loop it and so forth. But I wonder if you can yeah. sort of tie them into some of these cases, you know, where they're saying this guy or that gal did X, Y, Z. And I see that a woman today in a bench trial was tri- was uh, sentenced to two years, and she literally didn't do anything. She simply said, let's get Pel-, whatever she said about Pelosi. She literally did not do anything, did she? No, she didn't. I think that's Pauline Bauer. Yeah. Um, two and a half years, I believe, she got from Judge Trevor McFadden. I think the Trump appointed judge, I think you and I have talked about him before. Disaster. These judges are out of control. The prosecutors are out of control. Matthew Graves, the DC US attorney, is out of control. This is something that's never happened, which is why, Mark, they want to keep these videos, documents, records completely out of sight from the American people. Because the the story they sold us from the beginning, including the January sixth Select Committee, is a total fabrication at every level. Um, And that's why you see kind of these outbursts today by groups called the sedition hunters who are, you know, tracking people down, trying to destroy their lives. They're mad that we're going to get access to these tapes. We're going to turn this narrative on its head. The American people are going to be pretty shocked and outraged at some of the clips um, in context with new reporting that they're going to see over the next several weeks. And uh, when it comes to this January 6th committee, the members, I look at this guy Raskin. He's as radical as they come. He was involved in the impeachments. He was involved in the January 6th committee. He was involved in promoting the idea that the president of the United States can unilaterally issue debt, that is, uh, raise debt through bonds, which is so preposterous. He taught constitutional law for a period of time at, at American University. And I noticed his father, as you know, was a communist with, the, with, uh, with, uh, with an organization that he founded in uh, Washington, D.C., sympathetic for the longest time to the Soviet Union. It's not, it's not a lie. It's truth. And this guy is his finger in everything. Have you noticed that? He sure does. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he's going to have some explaining to do when some of these clips come out. Now, this McFadden, these so-called Trump judges and these other judges and so forth, I assume defense counsel kept asking for film. And so their clients never really got to see much of the film, and they were convicted without it. Isn't that correct? That's true. And I will again commend Kevin McCarthy, who I believe the first group he prioritized over journalists was defense attorneys and even some defendants. When I went to look at the tapes, there was one defendant in there looking at videos that he has been denied access to. Um, This has been a persistent problem in these cases. Uh, the, The DOJ blew past one discovery deadline after another, claiming that there was so much digital evidence that they could not provide all of the discovery to defendants. And the judges repeatedly, instead of tossing these charges out of court, here's what they did, Mark. They arrested people first created evidence later. And even Judge McFadden said that in the summer of 2021, when DOJ blew another discovery deadline, he said, this is not how the Constitution works. You don't charge people first and then get the evidence later. But did they do anything to stop DOJ? Did they dismiss a single case? No. They let DOJ, Matthew Graves, Merrick Garland, Lisa Monaco were running the show get away with all of it, completely stepping all over these defendants' constitutional rights. Um, Really a disgrace. Lisa Monaco is a radical leftist who worked in the Obama administration. I'm just telling the nation this. And I believe she's the invisible hand behind everything that's going on there because she's a true blue Marxist ideologue. And uh, I can just sense that she's behind all this. I think uh, the case of Garland, he supports it all. But he's kind of a Mueller type, if you know what I mean, kind of a, a Biden type, that, there, that there's somebody worrying. And she has a lot of energy, and I notice that less and less 
is her name appearing in the media less and less that she put her face on TV less and less as she called to testify because I think she likes her role more as the invisible hand than otherwise. Do you get that sense? 100%. Lisa Monaco is a longtime Obama loyalist. She was his last Homeland Security advisor. She was a key architect in the Russia collusion hoax. She left when uh, Trump won. She went to CNN as a contributor, con- consistently bashing Trump and Republicans. And she is now the deputy attorney general. And Mark, mm-hmm. what upsets me the most, two Republican senators voted against her confirmation, too. Ted Who Cruz and they? Rand Paul. She got Rand 48. Paul. Yes, Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, 48 Republican votes Lisa Monaco, Monaco got. Not a single question during her confirmation hearing about Russiagate or her involvement in any of it passed with flying colors. That's why this Department of Justice and FBI are not afraid of Republicans. They have no reason to be. Look, as the, the, the system, the, the confirmation system isn't working, and in part with judges it's not working because Lindsey Graham's on there putting his thumb up every time. Yes, 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 because he thinks mm-hmm. that's the prerogative of the president to get what he wants. Well, then why even bother having the Senate involved, right? If that's the way it's supposed to work, just say yes all the time. If you're going to be a yes man and a rubber stamp, we don't need the Senate per se to be involved. Well, Julie Kelly, if people want to keep reading what you're doing, and I, I'd like to have you back as more and more information comes out, if you don't mind, where do they go? I'd love to be on any time. Thank you so much. Um, people can pick up my book about January 6th on Amazon. Yes. Also, all my work is at American Greatness, amgreatness.com, and I post a lot of breaking news, as I did today on Twitter, Julie underscore Kelly, too. You're welcome here anytime. You take care of yourself. You too, Mark. Thanks so much for having me on. God bless you. We're running out of time, but i got to keep rolling here, ladies and gentlemen. James Comer was on Hannity last night. This guy is a real patriot. Real patriot. And um, he's talking about the FBI stalling, which is all it ever does. I saw Devin Nunes on, <coughs> excuse me, on television this day, today, too, and he said, hold him in contempt. No halfway measures here because this guy will, he will rope a dope you right to the end. Cut 11, go. Well, today was the deadline. He was given three weeks to produce a document uh, and go into detail on what exactly they did to investigate the validity of the document. Uh, But thus far, he won't even admit that they have the document, Sean. Uh, He's given us the runaround for three weeks. He's just stalling. He said there's good faith effort. They haven't produced anything. They haven't even admitted they have a document. So we don't have confidence in Director Ray. We're already in the process of drafting legislation to hold an oversight committee markup next week to uh, hold FBI Director Ray in contempt of Congress. Very, very important. Cut 12, go. They've had the document for four years. We don't know if they've even investigated it. Uh, That's my fear, that they never did anything. Uh, Would you look at what's happened with the IRS, what the IRS whistleblowers claim, is they were told to stand down. There's a pattern uh, within our federal government of when looking at any type of wrongdoing by the Biden family uh, that people in the government bureaucracy have told rank and file uh, government employees to stand down or or to give them the file and and don't worry about it. That's basically what Director Ray has told me. I have demonstrated a pattern of Joe Biden traveling all over the world and weeks after he leaves the country, his family starts mysteriously getting wires from that foreign country into shell companies that then are wired back to the individual family well, bank let me account. Ask you That's this. not normal behavior. And then I want to follow up with, uh, they've, they've dragged out James Comey. Uh, he's got a fiction out there. His whole life is a fiction. But listen to this. He's on CNN. Cut 13. Go. Historically, previously into the last few years, uh, it has largely been those on the left who have been critical of the FBI. You were a Republican for most of your life until you say the party left you. Why do you think so many Republicans have turned on the FBI? 
I think it's largely because Donald Trump and those around him have seen the FBI as a threat, and so they've taken a Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It's a sad fact that during part of its history, the FBI has been corrupt. It's a sad fact that when you've had corrupt presidents, you've had a corrupt FBI. And same with directors of the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover was director of the FBI for a very, very long time. It's a conspiracy, you see, that J. Edgar Hoover spied on Martin Luther King at the direction of John and Robert Kennedy. Conspiracy. It's a conspiracy that the FBI was used by Lyndon Johnson to spy on, believe it or not, Barry Goldwater and even Hubert Humphrey. And I can go down the list. It's called history. It's very simple. I have it in Unfreedom of the Press. Lays it out. Hook, line, and sinker. And so Comey's there. Comey, who in my view should have been charged and should be doing time. They bring Comey out to tell you that everything's fine. These are conspiracy theories of the right. Just shows you how nuts we are. No, we're not nuts. We saw what the FBI did with Twitter. We saw what the FBI has done with these whistleblowers. We saw what the FBI's done to Donald Trump. We've seen the FBI interfere in our elections. We saw what the FBI did with the FISA court. We've seen a lot. We saw the FBI spy on the Trump campaign. We're not making this stuff up. Plus, there's the Dorn report. That's right. James... Comey, this is just an attack because of Trump. Trump's been a victim, that's for sure. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Xi Jinping tells China's national security chiefs to prepare... For worst case scenarios, I'm telling you for the 4,000th time, they are preparing for war. They are preparing for war. And very few people in Congress are even talking about this. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has called on his top national security forces, officials, to think about worst case scenarios and prepare for stormy seas. So the ruling Communist Party hardens efforts to counter any perceived internal and external threats. He said the complexity and difficulty of the national security issues we now face have increased significantly. We must adhere to bottom line thinking and worst case scenario thinking. Get ready to undergo the major tests of high winds and rough waves and even perilous stormy seas. I don't know what else this guy can say to tell us that he wants war. And I read somewhere, someone, oh, who was it? I don't remember. I read so much. Who said, what is it any of our business if they attack Taiwan? What is it any of our business, he says. What is it any of our business if China's ally Russia attacks Ukraine? And then I ask, what is it any of our business then, as the logic goes, if they attack Poland or Romania? What's it any of our business if they attack South Korea? What's it any of our business? What's it any of our business if Iran attacks Israel? More on this tomorrow. No question about that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It's a great honor to always be here. We salute our military, police officers, firefighters, emergency personnel, our trucker friends, the men and women, the freedom fighters in Ukraine and Taiwan and elsewhere. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless you for being here today, and I'll see you tomorrow. Take care.